the pharmaceutical industry, the competition is intense. How do these brands get their messages out in front of the right audience at the right time? This is why I'm excited about my guest today, Stacey Gaines. She is the business development manager of Texair Publishing, and she's going to give us some insights on how pharmaceutical manufacturers can do this. But before we get started, my name is Donna Peterson, and you are listening to the B2B Marketing Excellence Podcast. I go around the world speaking with business owners, marketing leaders, talking about what is working and what is not. We all know marketing is changing at warp speed. We have to stay current. And that's, I'm hoping you'll get some good tactics and tips from these podcasts. So let's jump in. Hi, Stacey. How are you today? Hi, Donna. I'm doing well. Thank you. It's nice to see you again. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure to have you. We had such a great time talking at the Interfex show last year, yep. all about pharmaceutical manufacturers. How do they get their brands out there? And that's why I thought, I need to talk to her. She needs to come on the podcast. <laughs> I hope I can help. I'm sure you will. One of the things I wanted to ask you is, given your background in strategic partnerships in marketing, what strategies do you think are important for pharmaceutical manufacturers to effectively build those relationships? Ah, that's an age-old question that I've been asking myself for 25 years. <laughs> but I guess that being said, I mean, I'm happy to share with you what I have, you know, adopted for myself over the years and have passed along to my team over the years. There's really Perfect. Four things I keep tried and true to my heart, and they're not rocket science, right? They're your traditional sales strategies. I would say that the first one is that the old adage of people buy from people they trust is mm -hmm. absolutely true. Yes. And it's at the forefront of kind of everything I do. I try to remind myself of that every day. Um, and there are certainly ways that you can build that trust, but it takes time. Uh -huh. And I think one of the mistakes I see a lot of companies make today is they don't necessarily set a realistic timeline for how long it's going to take, especially if you have a new business development person in there yeah. or you're approaching a new client for the very first time. I mean, business development people may have multiple clients. They might have hundreds of clients yes. they need to contact on their list. They may have one key account with multiple divisions and multiple people. Regardless, you have to set real ex realistic expectations for how long that can take. And you know, I think the average, regardless of whether you're in the service industry or you're selling a product, can be at least eight to 10 touch points before yep. you're going to have a close deal. So how and long is that going to take in your world, right? That's right. And that's why I always get so concerned when I see people, they'll do one thing, they'll do one email blast, say it doesn't work and change course. Right. And I'm like, Wait, wait, and and not only are they changing course, they're going and changing several different things. Let's change the subject line. Let's change the content call to action. And it's now we don't know what was working and what was it. Oh, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I couldn't agree with you more. That was another thing that I, I often do is you have to pay attention to the sales cycle, right? Where is your potential buyer in their sales cycle? And I'm old school. I like the awareness and discovery of content, education, engagement with that content, driving to purchase, right? Where are they in that funnel? And I see a lot of companies just jumping all over the place and they'll come to me and say, hey, Stace, we're looking for lead gen. And I'll say, okay, I've, been in this, I've only been in the farm industry for four years. <laughs> But I read my competitive magazines and I read all of our newsletters and I don't know your company and what you do. Does everybody else? Okay, yes. Do they know why you're different than everybody else? You can't yeah. just jump into leads. You've got to establish what makes you different better. Yes. Why should someone pay attention to you? So I think yes. you're absolutely right. You have to be hitting people at the right time with the right message in the right place. But you have a, yeah. And you have a very good point right there because I'll speak to companies and oh, our competitors. And I said, wait a minute. If you do your marketing, you really don't have a competitor because this other company, maybe they're doing the same thing, but their mission might be different. Their goals might be different. And if you get that out in the marketplace, people will start to see, oh, you know what? They're different. They'll maybe build a, re a relationship with you. And that's when they'll buy from those companies over and over. 
Yes, exactly. That's such a good point. Some people might be looking to broaden their market share and not necessarily increase their sales. There's a lot of different goals floating around out there. And just because your competitor is doing one thing, it doesn't mean you need to jump on that same bandwagon or approach it the same way, for sure. Yeah. I think salespeople need to be strategic too, right? You need to do your homework and ask a ton of questions. I used to tell my salespeople over and over, if you're not asking a million questions, you're not doing your job because not only does that help establish your relationship and make sure that this potential partner to be knows that you have their best interests at heart, but it helps you understand where they fit into your world and how you can provide solutions where you can and where you can't. Yep. And you need to own where you can and where you can't, right? You can't be all things to all people. So That's right. I definitely use those tools. And I guess the most important thing for me in establishing a relationship is in-person meetings. And I think this industry got really, compl- I think the whole world got really <laughs> during COVID with these yeah. video calls. You need mm-hmm. to be in person with these people as often as you can. And the right people, if you can get buy-in from your decision makers along the way, it's going to be much easier at the end of the day to yeah. sign that bottom line. I think just like you said, right now, there are a lot more players involved in the decision to buy a piece of equipment or sign up for a magazine to go to a conference. There's more people there and you need to go to those in-person events because you build a rapport with sometimes it could be the entire team, which that will help you get to the sale quicker, but it'll also make you build those relationships that instill trust. Yes, exactly. And it's hard today. A lot of people have moved to working remotely. You can't just pop by the office on a Thursday afternoon and see three or four people. You might be lucky to get one. But I do think finding out where they are and seeing people face to face is key. I think you have to stay close to the the process as well. Mm -hmm. Um, When you're pursuing a new partnership, you can't just give up after one or two tries. You need to keep being persistent and trying to find new ways to find these people. Maybe it's LinkedIn. Maybe it is on an event. Maybe it's at their office. Maybe you found something in the news that makes sense for them. How do you relate? Yes. Um, Finding different ways to reach out, different vendors, tactics, things like that. And then if you do happen to sell something, don't abandon that process because gosh, you were the one they established trust with. And so if you just pass it off to a project manager, maybe that's the way it's supposed to work. But stay close to that company. You may have to come around and resell them, reignite them down the line. And it's also a great way to spy on your own company, right? Or to be inside. (laughs) How's it going? I know I flipped you over to this team. How are they doing? Anything that we can improve? So I think that's important too, staying close. And I think the last thing in building relationships for me is making it easy for people to buy from you. Yes. You've got a massive onboarding process. It's going to take forever set those expectations up front or figure out what's important to your buyer and get those things ironed out ahead of time. Yep. To be honest and upfront is key because if you tell them, okay, this might take six months or nine months, you're right. They set that expectation of what to expect. Not that you say, oh, it'll be up quickly. And here they are at three months. They're like, okay, what's happening? And then nothing. And then six months, now they're really getting mad. It, It really doesn't work out well for you. No, correct. Yeah, I'm with you. (laughs) The other thing I wanted to talk about is when we were talking about relationships and in-person events, I think you and I've talked about this before with you. I love in-person events because what I've seen now is because some companies are doing remote, they go to these conferences and the entire team comes to the conference because they meet, they have their team meetings They get the education from the conference, but you're right. If you're trying to talk to a company, now you can talk to maybe six players in that company, build a relationship. And so when you build that relationship, even if your step or hands-on with that client is over, you still might check in. Oh, how'd your daughter do? Did she go to Colorado? You just check in with them (laughs) and that just keeps that relationship going. Yeah, I think spot on. Yeah. It's it's very interesting, but the nuances of building a relationship do take time. <laughs> Absolutely. I see a lot of companies underestimate that time frame and expect revenue to be hitting their bottom line within a year. And sometimes you're looking at multi-million dollar CDMO yeah. deals. And of course the companies want to get going right away, but yeah. 
it's going to take a long time to get that over the line. And maybe the client you're approaching is already ready to sign on the dotted line with someone else. And you've got to go in and convince them that you're the better player. Knowing when their fiscal years are and where they are on that purchase funnel timeline is key. It is key. And I think sometimes companies have to remember, think about it yourself. Do you form like really deep relationships within one year? No, it's usually a series of years of different things that happen that make your relationship get deeper so that they end up being your best friends or best connections. And sometimes the best thing to do is say, I can't offer you that service, but here's somebody who can. And then when they have something for you, they'll come back to you. They trust you. Don't try to be all things to all people. Do what you do. Shout it from the rooftops, but... Cough it up when you don't. Yeah, that's a really hard thing to do because as a business owner and we're in the B2B marketing space, it's hard for me to sometimes say no to people because I'd like to help everyone. Of course, you want to see your company grow, but I know my wheelhouse is manufacturing. It's pharmaceutical manufacturers, metalworking or the food industry. So it's very specific niche. And so I have said no where some business owners are like, what are you crazy? Yes, I'm not going to have those sales, but it ends up the client's going to be better served because they're going to go to an expert in their area. I'm going to spend my time working in my lane that I'm good at. It's going to take us less time and it's really going to end up really being more profitable for the company to say no. I'm telling you that person has friends in the business too and and acquaintances and colleagues and they're going to say, oh, I just spoke to the perfect manufacturing B2B marketer. You've got to go see Donna. Yes. So I I think what comes around goes around. And if you're, if you have integrity and you stay true to who you are as a business, it it can only help you. Yeah, I I agree. I agree. You and I could talk about relationships all day, but (laughs) one of the areas of building relationships comes down to segmenting your files. And how can you explain your process in doing that and segmenting your files so that you can give messaging that really resonates with that individual? Sure. Yeah. I think it's really important for, for a lot of reasons. Let me back up. I think the most important thing is quality of audience, right? Whether you're looking at reach or Mm -hmm. you're looking at segmenting your audience, you Mm -hmm. don't just want to roll down your car window and throw out a bunch of money away and (laughs) Even if you're looking for big numbers, you want to, anybody can buy yeah. traffic today. So who is the audience that you're reaching? Where are they from? Are they an organic audience? Did you buy a list? Like, where does that come from? Yes. I think it's important to know that when you're partnering with somebody. And I think segmenting is important just because it helps you increase your ROI for the most yeah. part and mm-hmm. reduce your waste. From I think it hours. saves you time. It oh, also yeah. saves you a lot of time. Yeah, that's a really good point. From our perspective at Texair, we have a very broad, for each brand, a very broad audience umbrella for the medicine maker, which is the brand I work on. That's the pharmaceutical industry, right? But then we have subsets underneath that brand, Mm -hmm. whether that be the cell and gene advanced therapy section or small molecules and equipment manufacturers or um, bioprocessing. And then from there, we slice and dice through our robust audience development platform any way you like. So if you're looking for, I would really like to reach biotech within biopharma, and I'm looking for R&D, and I'm looking for lab scientists who work in cell line development, we can do that for you. I have a a partner right now who is running an umbrella campaign, um, and they are targeting three very distinct audiences underneath their umbrella campaign with distinct messages and it's all going on at the same time. Um, I just finished a campaign for another company who ran four email blasts to a very small niche audience of under 2000 people. And they pull that campaign across the four email blasts pulled an 89% open rate on average with an 8% click through rate. Actually, absolutely increase your ROI. That being said, there are tactics for everything. And I do worry that sometimes we're abandoning, we're we're, we're going with trends or we're Mm -hmm. abandoning the tried and true to try to stay on top of the market. For Mm -hmm. example, I come from video games and tech and that industry 10 years ago said, we're all going digital. We need to measure where we're going. Mm -hmm. And now they're all coming back to traditional print and other ways of emails that are more engaging, right? That keep people engaged longer. So there's definitely a way to use segmentation 
if it's mm-hmm. done right. And then I guess you can also look at segmentation across tactics yes. too, right? So yes. with our platform, you can I can tell you how many people we have in that segment for our newsletters, for our email blast lists, and you can hit them different ways with different messaging or how many people have engaged with a certain type of content online. We can yep. build a mirror audience of ours on our social media platforms and then blast that out for you on Meta and yep. LinkedIn. So a lot of different ways to segment, but it is definitely a time saver and a money saver. It is. And this is why industry specific publications are such a valuable source. I will shout that from the rooftops because a lot of people come into me and say, oh, Donna, I'm just going to buy these 10,000 leads, or I'm going to use this B2B data platform. And I'm like, But you don't understand if you go to industry specific publications, they can do exactly what you say. They can whittle it down. So maybe you're not going out to 10,000 or maybe you're still going out to 10,000, but your 2000 is going to get this message and 2000 is going to get this message because you have all the details about the individual. Some of it's already self-reported, meaning the individual reported the information. You're not scraping the information off wherever. No, this is self-reported information. So the people are giving it, they're definitely interested in it. And now you're able to send them messages that speak directly to them with a subject line. And of course you got what, 89% open rate you said? We did. It was amazing. And I, that company only spent a couple thousand dollars on that campaign. So I think that it can be really effective. And what you're saying about lists, I do think that there, c- companies like Texair and our competitors out there, we spend a lot of money to promote our own brand, yes. right? Mm-hmm. And build our own organic audiences. And there's brand loyalty there. And there's, there is credibility in that message coming from one of those oh, brands. Yeah not necessarily from Zoom Info or from some other place you can get a generic list. They've engaged with our content. They've opted into our content. They want to be receiving it. And that's half the battle. Yeah. It's if you do a banner and you just use a programmatic platform when it gets your banner up there everywhere where they're looking, or (laughs) you put it on a newsletter of a reputable publisher. If I get something in from AMA or marketing profs, I open it because that is my wheelhouse. That's my area. You subscribe. We subscribe to it. And if you've subscribed to a newsletter, you're going to open it, meaning they're going to see your banner. Yes. I, I think that there is a lot of credibility in going with publishers and with media partners or with partners who have lists that you trust, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah, it's a whole gray area. You've got to be careful, but you're right. You've got to trust it, but you got to do a lot of research knowing exactly where do the names come from? How do you keep them cleaned and updated? But I don't need to educate you on that, all that. A question I have then, so what matrix do you prioritize when evaluating the success of a pharmaceutical manufacturing campaign? That's a good question. I come from the media side. Mm-hmm. So I let the clients dictate what's important to them or our partners mm-hmm. dictate what's in, first and foremost. So they'll deliver us their KPIs. And it's my job or our job to say, we can deliver on these and we can't deliver on those. Right. You still want to move forward. Yes, we do. And then providing what's important to them. For some people, it's what is our cost per lead and are we hitting that cost? For other people, it's we're just looking at impressions. Some people are looking at click-through rates yes. or video completion rates. So it's different for every single ad partner. We just need to be really clear on what we can deliver and when we can deliver, how yeah. often that reporting is going to come in, meeting their expectations. And I think one thing that I really pride myself on is trying to catch those if we need to optimize a campaign or try to catch any right. issues sooner than later. If an audience target isn't working, it's too broad, maybe it's too narrow Mm -hmm. uh, to go to that client and say, hey, this isn't really working. This is what, why we think it might not be working. These are ways we think we can optimize it. Do you want to try this for round two? If that doesn't work, you just have to own what's going on and, and then make good on that. I think I let the clients lead on metrics, but for the usual standard, of course, is here's how many impressions you're yes. getting. Here's, yeah. here's, you know, here's how many people engaged. Here's how many people clicked. And, and we go from there. So from what everything you said, there's two things that stood out. The first thing is that open communication back and forth. 
I agree with you. The company has to tell you clearly, what are they looking at as their goals? Yes. You know, what are their KPIs? But then the other thing that I've tried to stress to my clients, because I know they want to see high open rates, high click-through rates. And of course, sometimes that can be a gray area. And again, I know I sound like I'm saying the same thing, but when we go to industry-specific sources, I told them, you've got to have some confidence that your brand is in the right spot. People don't put a lot of value or they really can't put a number to branding. With a lot of my equipment guys, it may they may not need an HPLC machine right then and there, but if they see the message over and over with good information that they're giving out, good instruction or just tidbits, guess what? When they need that HPLC machine, they're going to reach out to that company. And that's where I say, you've got to have confidence in the sources you're using. I agree. I, but I also think you're, you're touching on a good point too. If you're not, if you're not there, you're not there. You're right. right? You can't be seen if, if you don't have a message out in the market, even just a general awareness ongoing. I see a lot of companies come out of the woodwork or they've just done a merger and acquisition and they've changed their brand name and they run it for six months and they say, okay, the awareness portion is over. <laughs> you think, really? <laughs> Really? Yes. I don't know if it really should be. You know? um, yeah, I, I think you're right. You have to be there at the right time with the right message. And you have to make sure that your plan incorporates, you know, that funnel throughout the entire campaign. Yeah. If, if something's not working for you too, maybe it's the persona that you've built and it needs adjusting and you can learn from your yes. campaigns what's working and what's not and create or build a new persona. Try a new publication or a new vendor. Yes. Perhaps you've actually just oversaturated their audience with yes. your message. Try something new. We've done that where we've paused something for a while, we've gone back and then it works great again. But like you said, if you take little adjustments, then you can analyze it to see what is it that we should change? Where if they go in and they change five different things, and I mentioned this before, how do we know? How do we know what is working and what's not? And that's where one thing at a time they should change. Yeah, we do this with our businesses, your business, yeah. our business, all the time we make adjustments. Our small yes. molecule, we used to have a print publication. Now we have a newsletter and we've limited the amount of newsletters for small molecule that go out. And we've created a section in our magazine because we had a lot of duplication between our pharma audience and our small molecule audience. Now, because we've limited the exposure, or I shouldn't say limited, but limited the number of contacts we're hitting these people with, the engagement's through the roof. Yeah. So you have to make those adjustments along the way, whether you're a provider or an advertiser. And that's hard thing for a provider to do because of course they'd love to get more revenue. But in the end, I feel if they limit the exposure, the messages will be received better from the individual. And then the advertisers are going to see a better rate, which... Customers. And you'll yes. have, yeah, it's definitely a del delicate balance and it takes a lot of people above my pay grade making those decisions a lot of the time, but... Yeah. Uh, but it's worth it to do those deep dives. It, it is. You got to stick to quality. You can't just bombard your list. You can't just be saying, oh yeah, take a hundred thousand for a fact. Really only 5,000 are going to be interested. And when you do, that's when you'll see those good results. I agree. Yeah. So then I was going to ask you, <laughs> give us an example of a successful campaign, but I'm sorry. I think you already gave that to us. When you're seeing an 89% oh. what open rate, and then you said a 8% click-through rate? Yeah. D do you have another campaign you want to tell me about? <laughs> that was a really good one. And, and it was a great, and I actually shared that with our entire sales team to yeah. show them how well segmenting can work, right? And that customer I know is going to come back and it might've been small dollars on our end, but a great ROI for them. And so the next time they want to run, absolutely, they'll come back to us. And that's what it's all about. I do think that one thing that I've learned in this business, I think needs improving upon is the one-off campaigns that I see run all day long. And our most successful campaigns tend to be longer form, uh, multi-tactic, omni we did one recently for a well-established brand in the business who had a new service coming out. They wanted to do a, a webinar. So we ran our traditional e-blasts and newsletters. We ran the webinar, which I love webinars, 
I love educational pieces because yes. they can hit awareness, they can hit education, and if you gave them their lead generating, right? Yeah. So you can kill a lot of birds with one budget. <laughs> yeah. But what we did is we took that webinar and we turned it into an article post webinar that we ran in print and online. We pulled out segments of the print article and segments of the yes. video. Yes. To use on social media, Instagram with the video, Twitter with the short form. And it worked really well. And then if you engaged in an e-blast for the webinar, but didn't actually register, we went and retargeted you and said, hey, do you want to watch on demand? And if that didn't work, here's the gated article. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So we were able to hit so many different facets with one, pretty much one budget for a webinar. Yeah. So that one worked really well too. That is so wonderful because a lot of people just do the one-offs, like you said, one and done, that's it. And no, you can get so much out of it. Just like this podcast with us, we've talked about it. Afterwards, you're going to get seven podcast links. You're going to get YouTube, but then you also get videograms, short videograms that you can use on LinkedIn and then smaller ones that you can use on YouTube because you can do this interview. So what we're going to talk for maybe about 30 minutes, you can break that up. It can give you at least 15 days worth of content. That is, and that's inside. I didn't even think about how many pieces of content you can get out of this oh, one. <laughs> oh, I know. I know for a fact, I've said to people, if you do an hour long interview, you can get 60 days worth of social media posts, LinkedIn newsletters. You can create a plethora of content. I'm quoting you on that. <laughs> you can uh, from this one interview. And the great part about it is like what you said, you end up then not even really think about a cohesive strategy because on every single one of these challenges, it really ties back into that one message. So it reinforces it and giving. I say to clients all the time, give that educational information out because then that proves you're a thought leader and it instills the trust. Economies of scale, sister, economies of scale. <laughs> yes. Yes. And because if you do something like this or a webinar, people know it's not AI generated. You and I are actually <laughs> talking. True. It's it's us because now people are seeing all these blogs out there and all these articles and people are stepping back saying, you know what, is this really them or is this just ge generated, AI generated? Where if you talk like this, when they see our faces, they figure us out a little bit. Is she quirky? Is she this? But then they also know it's our actual voice, our actual thoughts. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. It's one of the things you asked me in the beginning of this was how to build relationships. And I think authenticity is, oh. I should have added that to my list. You yeah. have to be authentic, right? Yeah. That's how you can stand out is if yep. you're authentic and you show your uniqueness. So again, World Innovators, a B2B marketing agency, but we're 43 years old. We're women owned. We're family owned. You see how it brings us down to a smaller pool. And then we deal with basic in the industrial space. So what use was this big pool of B2B now mm -hmm. is down to here, which is great because these people understand us when we're talking and we're able to give them a lot of value. I hope so. Sure hope so. <laughs> That's exactly what Texera is doing. You're, you said it with the segmenting of your, whether it's an email blast or whether it's a marketing campaign across different channels, when you do, that's when you're really going to build those relationships. I think so too. Yeah. So my last question for you, and you might've just answered that by saying being authentic, but is there an emerging trend you foresee for the future for pharmaceutical manufacturers? Ah, oh my gosh. I said that I come from the land of tech and video games. Mm -hmm. And I've said for years that the farm industry is about 10 years behind where I see other business to consumer and some other B2B industries. Mm -hmm. That being said, I think COVID put everybody on an even playing field for a while. And during that time, I think technology really blossomed and with things like generative AI yes. and machine learning. Mm -hmm. I saw actually one of your podcasts on generative AI and how it can be useful. I think that tool is amazing. Yeah. I think it's not an emerging trend, but it's getting harder and harder for companies today to get data. 
They have to get through GDPR and all the consumer protections that are happening now in our space. And so I think content is king. It has been, and it's going to remain king for a while. You, it has to be high quality in order to yes. get people to opt in and engage. And yes. so you can either tap experts and help your own SMEs for that content. But a lot of people are either smaller startup companies or they're massive and they their SMEs don't have time. Um, you can tap publishers like yes. myself or agencies like yourself to help with that content. But you can also sit down and crank something out and have one of your SMEs take a look at it and just tweak it. You yes. can use a generative AI to maybe refresh older content yes. and breathe new life into evergreen content that might be driving SEO to your business. So I definitely think gener generative AI is going to be hitting us over the head in a few years. And I finally see this industry and I'm so grateful catching up in terms of video. It's gotten so yeah. much cheaper to produce 82% yeah. of traffic out there, <laughs> mobile traffic or video traffic is video yeah. on web traffic and yeah. things like social media. Finally, it, it can be so useful and inexpensive and highly targeted. So I definitely see trends in those areas. Thinking about anything else, maybe partnerships. I know it's been a huge yeah, collaboration kind of year yeah. in mergers and acquisitions. And I see some partners now, like we had an aseptic filling CDMO partner with an equipment manufacturer last year to share costs of a sponsored feature. Like yeah. I'm hoping more uh, partnerships like that will come into play. It just reduced costs for everyone around. It gives everybody kind of a broad perspective. So yeah, I, I yeah. definitely see a lot of things happening in the way of, of B, business to consumer coming to the world of B2B. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely agree. When COVID hit, it did push B2B to concentrate on quality, but also concentrate on those personal, getting that personal out there. Companies can't stand behind just pictures of their machine. They've got to put some of their key employees, those actual faces out there. And then, like you said, generative AI right now, when I go and I speak at different conferences, that is one of the top topics they always want me to talk about is generative AI and their marketing. And the only thing I will stress to people is because you have the peak companies that jump on and they're like, okay, we're going to get oh. 20 blogs out this week, month. And but they uh -huh. just take the generated content and push it out there. All we're doing there is creating noise. We're just Not crowding authentic. the marketplace. Authentic. Right. And, and you're oversaturating the market. Yes, you are. And that's why I say I like using chat GPT or any as a baseline, as an assistant. An that assistant maybe tool. It gives you an idea, maybe me tweak something that you already wrote. So it's your thoughts, your ideas. Yeah. It can be definitely very useful. I just warn companies to be careful. Don't just, you know, I generate. Think you're right. I, I also would warn companies to be careful of other trends. Make sure that they're tried and true or that you have the budget to roll down your window. Podcast is a great example. I'm getting a lot of inquiries about podcasts. Well, podcasts were meant to build an audience yes. or to tap an audience that already exists. People expect additional content to be coming down the line, not a one-off. Yeah. So you can't expect to do one podcast and have that perform well for you. It needs to be marketed or presented as a series. It could, depending on the topic and where you're marketing it, but I would just be wary of trends and then blowing them off as they didn't work for you or without yes. really digging into the data to find out how you could have perhaps improved that. Or Yeah. I read a statistic the other day. I wish I knew it off the top of my head, but I don't. But I think it was 90%, 90% of podcasts stop after five episodes. Now, I understand that because I remember at first when I started this, I'm like, oh my goodness, is anyone listening to this? Like, why <laughs> am I bothering? But the numbers do not show the true picture. Now, I've been at trade shows and I know I've told this story before, but a stranger I didn't even know came up to me and said, I listened to your podcast, keep up the great work and walked away. And I'm like, wait a minute, who? <laughs> but you're getting a reach farther than you think. And five isn't enough to see if podcasting works. This will be episode 76 for us. And so we have kept this going every other week. Like you said, with the continuity, people know we're going live with another. Yes. Episode. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And yes. 
So you can't give up and you got to go a little long term to see if it works or not. Yeah, you can't just run it one time and then say, well, how's that worked for me? Yeah, it doesn't work. Okay. Stacy, I want to thank you so much for your time today. I found this to be very helpful and I know my listeners will also. So thank you very oh, much. I always love talking to you, Donna, and I look forward to seeing you again in person. <laughs> Definitely. Hopefully Interfex. Yes, I'll be there. I'll be there with bells on. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye.